Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, particularly Thomas, for giving me this opportunity to talk to me about work that has been done with my former PhD student, Moise Bonilla Nisea. Sorry. And what we are going to talk about is the problem that he came across when he was interested in uh, time-dependent tunneling problems. And so he saw that there is a way to treat this with Bohmian mechanics. And when he told me this, I said, well, I think there is a problem with the definition of what they call Bohmian trajectories, that we better first have a look at this before we apply them. And so today I will show you what is the problem with these trajectories, how you can solve the problem, and what are the consequences for the physical interpretation of Bohmian mechanics. So first of all, what is Bohmian mechanics is one of many um, alternative interpretation of quantum mechanics, but the particular point about this one is it tries to find a deterministic formulation of quantum <coughs> mechanics and it claims that there exist real physical path of real particles that are following this path and in principle this path should also be possible to find them experimentally. But so far the problem is there is no experiment that was able to detect this and so I will show you that what enters into the definition of, the, of these trajectories has a problematic aspect, how you can solve it and what will be the consequences. So first let, let me uh, tell you a bit about the formal basis of Bohmian mechanics. So it's essentially the hydrodynamic formulation of quantum mechanics that goes back to Marlow in 1926. So he rewrites the a complex Schrödinger equation in terms of two uh, real equations by making, sorry, by making this polar ansatz for the wave function and inserting this in the Schrödinger equation it gets one equation for the density and one equation for the phase. Now in the following we will concentrate on this continuity equation for the density where you have this velocity field which is a kind of convention velocity. And this is the basis for the definition of the so-called quantum uh, trajectories. So, you see? So what is this trajectory? Well, they use the definition of this velocity field and they say, okay, this is just the time derivative of a trajectory that we call Q of T. And once we know this trajectory, we know that the particles are following this trajectory. Now, you see, if you look at this, at first sight, it seems to be okay, and you find it in all the textbooks that are dealing with Bohmian mechanics, but if you look closer, you will see here what we have is not a velocity like in classical mechanics, it's a velocity field that depends on two independent variables, on position and on time. And here they simply say, oh well, we will replace the independent variable x by a time-dependent one. So you just eliminate one independent variable without any justification. And therefore we said, okay, uh, of course you can do this. You can go from a higher dimensional space to a lower one. Like, let's say you go in three dimensions and you make a constraint that you say, okay, I only want to consider all the points that have the constant distance from a fixed point. Then you get the surface of a sphere, a two-dimensional subspace. But then, of course, the price you have to pay, you have to introduce a constraint. Now, what is the possible constraint we can include here in order to justify this switch from an independent variable x to a dependent one, q of t? So, we also had the idea that we could just take an analogy from thermodynamics. So, he had this idea, well, if you look in thermodynamics, you have the internal energy as a function of volume and entropy. Now you can write down a total differential of the internal energy in terms of these expressions. And this is the total differential if this Maxwell relation is <coughs> That means the partial derivatives with respect to volume and entropy have to fulfill this relation so the mixed second derivatives are equal. Now you can look at specific processes where the internal energy is constant, so du is equal to zero, and this constraint allows you to replace the independent variable entropy by a dependent one that we call sigma under this constraint. So you can replace uh, uh, the entropy by sigma as a function of the remaining variable of the volume. 
If you do this, you end up with this relation, and now you can find a relation that tells you how sigma depends on the volume. Now, how does this transform to our specific Bohmian problem? Now, what we did, we just defined a Bohmian function, as we call it, as a function of the two independent variables, position and time. Now, we were writing down the differential in this form, and so the partial derivative with respect to time was minus j minus the current, and the partial differential with respect to space was the density. Now, if you write down this and you want to fulfill this Maxwell relation, it turns out the Maxwell relation is just the continuity equation, which is in agreement with our initial assumption that we separate the Schrodinger equation into these two hydrodynamic ones. Now, the question is, okay, this is fine, but what is the meaning of this Bohm function and can we find a function that fulfills this? So it turned out, yes, you can find this function. This function is a so-called <coughs> cumulative probability function. So this definition shows you that this function b of x and t is just the amount of probability that you get when you integrate from minus infinity to a specific border x over the probability density. Now, with this definition, you can show that the partial derivatives just fulfill the requirement that the continuity equa uh, equation is valid. Okay, what does this mean? What is the consequence for our Bohmian mechanics? Well, first of all, we can now um, put in the constraint that we look at situations where B is constant, and then we can reduce our total differential to this form, and now we can just skip row on both sides, and what we end up is now our guidance law for Bohmian trajectories. But now it's not just postulated, now it's derived under the assumption that B is a constant. That means the amount of probability between minus infinity and the border of this integration is a constant quantity. So here I show you this again. So this is the definition of this cumulative probability function. And x is now the border of a fixed amount of probability. And of course, if we replace x by q of t, that means the border can be flexible. But what does it mean? The amount of probability is constant, but if the border is flexible, that means we can move it closer to minus infinity. That means we squeeze the probability density, we increase the amount of um, the density in this area, or if we move it further away from minus infinity, the, uh, the, at a certain point, the density of probability gets smaller. So I just want to give you an illustrative example how this works. But let us assume we look at this distance from here to here, and we make position measurements. So after we find our system at five positions, we make a border. Now we make the next uh, position measurements, another five detections, another border, and so on. And now we make a point at each position where we have one of these border lines. Now we repeat this at a later time, and of course, because our system can move, we will find the positions at a different uh, uh, space. So our border lines will also move, and again for another time. Now we just connect these measurement points by a continuous line, and what we have, this continuous line is just our Bohmian trajectory. And you can see here, these trajectories are close together, but we know the amount of probability from here to minus infinity is constant, the same from here to minus infinity. That means the amount of probability between two of these trajectories is also constant. So going from here to here shows that the probability density between those two lines has to decrease when we go in this direction or has to increase when we go between these two lines. So now we have a, a good idea what all of this is about and now I'll give you a specific example where you have analytical solutions of the time dependent Schrodinger equation to show you what is the expression you obtain in this case for this Bohmian trajectories. So we look at the time dependent Schrodinger equation for uh, at most quadratic potentials, we know in this case we have solutions that are Gaussian wave packets. Okay, 
So we have this Gaussian wave packet. If you insert this into the time dependent Schrodinger equation, you get an equation for the maximum and one that is proportional to the width of the wave packet. And these two parameters determine uniquely what is the evolution of your uh, Gaussian wave packet. Now, if you do this, you see this, what I call eta of t, is the maximum, and this follows the classic trajectory. What is here sigma is the mean square deviation in position, and this one is related with the complex Riccati equation via this quantity that I call alpha. So this alpha is more or less the width of the wave packet, this eta is the maximum, and we will see that the relative change of the width is important for our moving trajectory. So now we take our definition of the Bohmian trajectory as we have seen it before. We replace x by q of t by imposing our constraint and then we can simply show that the Bohmian trajectory is the classical trajectory plus a term that depends on the initial difference between the mean value, which is the classical position, and the initial value of our Bohmian trajectory modulated by the time dependence of the spreading of the wave packet. Now you can uh, calculate this explicitly and I will just show you the example for the free particle motion that means the spreading wave packet that we know is spreading quadratically in time. So if you look at the trajectory itself, you see this is just if you coincide the initial value of the mean value with the one of the Bohmian trajectory, you just get the classical trajectory that is going proportional to time. Now if we move with the maximum of the wave pack, we will see what remains is just the contribution that depends on the difference between the mean value of the uh, classical path and the initial value of our trajectory. And you see, because the wave pack is spreading, the space between two of these lines is increasing, which coincides that the, um, that the probability density at a given point is decreasing when the wave pack is spreading. So what I want to show you quickly is how you can extend this whole thing to include a dissipative environment. We did this in the following way. Well, you see, for the conservative case, we have a continuity <coughs> equation that contains a convective velocity field. Now, in order to break the time reversal, we just include a diffusion term that turns the uh, continuity equation in a kind of Fokker-Planck equation. Now, if you add a term to the continuity equation, this will result in an additional imaginary contribution to the Schrodinger equation. Now, what we did is the following. We took this modified density equation, this Fokker-Planck equation, and we tried to separate it into two equations. That is one, the Schrodinger equation, and the other, the conjugate complex of it. But you cannot do this in general, but you can find certain <coughs> conditions where this is possible. And one of them was that we add, we, we uh, take this separation ansatz and we end up with this logarithmic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. You see, it contains a non unitary transformation term because the, this part will end up here with the imaginary unit. But we have here subtracted the mean value, so we still have normalized solutions. And if you do this, you can even find analytical solutions. And you will also see the equation for the phase contains now uh, irreversible friction force. And the point is, the only thing that changes, your maximum now follows the classical trajectory including the friction force, and the width has a slight modification, but the overall velocity and the overall current has the same structure as before. That means, if we now write down our Bohmian trajectory, you have the same structure, you have the classical one, plus the, uh, the difference between the initial value and the initial value of the mean value, modulated again by the time dependence of the corresponding wave packet. So, to summarize, the transition from the independent variable x to the dependent one q of t is possible if we, input, uh, if we impose a constraint. And this constraint is related with a function that is a, a probability distribution. So Bohmian trajectories are not path of real particles, but they are borderlines of areas of defined probability, so-called quantiles. So Bohmian mechanics is not deterministic, but also probabilistic, but in a different way 
in conventional quantum mechanics, you take the statistical inference point of view, that means you calculate mean values in higher moments. Here you take the point of view of descriptive statistics, that means you are interested in a part of the distribution given from infinity to a certain borderline. And the extension to open systems, if you use it in this effective way, is straightforward and I just have shown to you. So, if you are interested in If you are interested in details, you will find most of it what I was talking about in this one. And we expanded the whole thing also to include booming mechanics in momentum space and further details. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just having a little bit of trouble understanding your motivation of doing that parametrization with the BOM function, because I understand the emphasis on uh, Madeleine's hydrodynamic approach, mm -hmm. but uh, arguably all the ideas go back to the Broy, and yeah. for the Broy it was not a hydrodynamic um, analogy, but really a unification of the principle of uh, stationary action mm -hmm. and the principle of Maupertuis. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so it was, it was more of an optical <coughs> analogy. Uh, and the solution to the... If you, if you can go back to your, your slides, uh, where you first introduced the equations. Uh, yes, okay. So the solution to, to that equation of S for the phase is like a hamilton jacobi equation. Um, which gives you a function in configuration space. Mm -hmm. And you have your problem already in the classical theory, without rho. Already in the standard hamilton jacobi theory, you can say that the derivative of q with respect to t mm -hmm. is given by a gradient of the hamilton jacobi solution interpreted as the on-shell action of the system. Yeah, but, but there you cannot define this problem function. So I'm just wondering, uh, what do you do there in the classical theory? No, in the classical case, oh, sorry. In the classical case, the action is a function of time. Here, the action is the phase <coughs> of the wave function. So yeah. it's a field. It's not a, a time-dependent function anymore. This is a big difference. And yeah. actually, the definition of the action is the one that Schrödinger used to define this wave function. So the action. I, I fail to see the difference. It's just a time derivative, just like the time dependent Hamilton Jacobi equation. No, the not. only difference is that you have the quantum potential. Well, the quantum potential is not a potential anyway. No, it's fine. A but the energy. Okay, so maybe we can open okay. the discussion. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I had a very quick question about uh, putting in the diffusion term in the. Uh, in the uh, continuity equation and then the Fokker plan. Uh, so I was wondering that um, uh, instead of this interpretation uh, that this term would uh, be something like a uh, contribution from an open quantum system, uh, it seems uh, perhaps to me more natural now if we take that Fokker plan and write it back in some sort of Ito equations that we would get uh, a stochastic Schrodinger equation. Uh, would, would you do you think that's a good interpretation, or do you think that there's a reason that this has to come from an open quantum system? So you see, the point is, if you want to describe some open system that has some interaction with some environment, you have to break the time symmetry. Now, as long as you stay to the continuity equation, you will never be able to do this. So you have to add something. But anything you add to the for, uh, to the continuity equation, we end up with the imaginary contribution in the Schrödinger equation. So you will have this kind of uh, non-unitary time evolution in the usual sense. And we were looking for special cases where you can add something that leads to something physically reasonable. And so we found this ansatz, if you put this in, you can separate rho into psi and psi star contributions, you end up with this. And if you do this, your phase contribution is now fixed. So you get an additional uh, contribution from the phase, and if you take the gradient, then you get something like the total time derivative of the velocity, which is a force, and this has this additional uh, friction force. So you just get a specific 
uh, model of an open system with this friction force. If you separate the Fokker Planck equation in a different way, you get a different physical situation. So there are other possibilities. But it isn't, at least in principle, the way to break the time symmetry. Just adding something to the continuity equation. Okay. Let's thank the speaker.